All right, our next topic in modern physics, uh, we're still dealing with the Bohr atom, but now we're going to look at the velocity of the electron in the orbit around the nucleus. We've already determined the radius. Uh, we've also determined the energy of the electron. Now let's find the velocity of the electron. And again, going back to the principle of the angular momentum, knowing that it's mrv for any object, any point object going around a circle with radius r and mass m. We also know that in small objects like electrons, the angular momentum has to be quantized. And so L, the angular momentum, is always equal to the energy multiple of h bar, h bar, of course, being h divided by 2 pi. Let's write that down. So h bar is equal to h divided by 2 pi. And then if we set those equal to each other, we have mrv equals to n h bar. And so v is equal to n h bar divided by m times r. All right, let's now plug in the values for the first orbit. The radius is, of course, 0 0.053 nanometers. So an n being 1 for the first orbit, we can say that v for the first orbit is equal to 1 times 1.055 1 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Divide the whole thing by the mass, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And then R, now we know that to be 0 0.053 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. 10 to the minus 9 meters, of course, nanometers. So what is the velocity of an electron like that? Um, okay, uh, 1.055 e34 minus, divide 9.11 e to the 31 minus, and divide by 0 0.053 e to the 9 minus equals... And the velocity would be 2.185 times 10 to the 6th meters per second. Now, hmm, how fast is that? That's 2.1 or 2.2 million meters per second, or 2.2 or 2,200 kilometers per second. Wow, that's like from here to Dallas in one second. Here being in Los Angeles to Dallas, that's quite fast. But if you compare it to the speed of light, remember that c is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, then you can see that it's slightly less than 1% the speed of light. So that's kind of amazing when you think about the speed of an electron in the nucleus of an atom. It moves at almost 1% the speed of light. So just for the interest, how many times per second does an electron travel around the nucleus of an atom like that? All right. We know that distance is equal to velocity times time, and uh, time, let's see here. In this case, the distance would be the circumference, which is 2 pi r, and the velocity, which we just figured out, and the time, of course, would be the period of, um, of one revolution. And, of course, the period is, is inversely proportional to the frequency, so we can say that 2 pi r is equal to 1, is equal to, um, let's get rid of 1, I don't want that yet, uh, the velocity times uh, 1 over the frequency, so we can write it like that. And so therefore we know that the frequency, the number of times that the electron goes around every second, is equal to the velocity divided by 2 pi r, which is the circumference of the orbit. So that would be equal to 2.185 times 10 to the 6th meters per second. <clears throat> and we divide that by 2 pi times the radius, which is 0 0.053 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. All right, that should be an interesting calculation. So divide by 2 and divide by pi, and then divide by 0 0.053 e to the 9 minus equals, and it is 6.56 times 10 to the 15 hertz. Hertz, hertz, not hertz, hertz. Wow, that's a big number. Because 10 to the 9th is billion, 10 to the 12th is trillion, so this would be 6,565, let's see, 6,560 trillion times per second. So the electron zips around the nucleus of a hydrogen atom more than 6,000 trillion times every second. That's quite amazing. All right, now what would be the velocity? And what would be the wavelength of an electron in the second orbit, for example? So for that, let's go back and say, okay, what is the wavelength of the, um, 
of the electron in the innermost orbit. Okay, there's two ways of doing that. First of all, the assumption was that the electron will travel around the inner orbit where the distance of one orbit was exactly equal to one wavelength. Again, in order for the electron not to, not to destructively interfere with itself, the orbit of an electron has to be an integer, num an integer multiple of its wavelength. So that would mean, we can then assume, that the wavelength was equal to 2 pi r. Is that a good assumption? Well, there's a way to check that. So if we assume that to be true, what would be the wavelength in this case? So the wavelength would be equal to 2 pi times the radius, that would be 0 0.053 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. So let's figure that out first. So we have um, uh, 0.053 e to the 9 minus times 2 times pi. And so we can say that this would be equal to lambda is equal to 0 0.333 nanometers. All right, that's the assumption. Now, there's another way in which we can check that. Since we know the velocity right here of the, of the electron, we can go back to the de Broglie wavelength, and we can say that the wavelength is equal to h divided by mv, and we should get the same result if we do that. Let's see if that's true. So this is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 divided by, and that would be of course joules times seconds, divided by the mass, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, and then the, times the velocity, which we found to be 2.185 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. And let's see if that gives us the same result. All right, so 6.626 e to the 34 minus, divided by 9.11 e to the 31 minus, and divide by 2.185 e to the sixth equals, and how about that? Lambda is equal to 0 0.333 nanometers. So not only were we able to find the radius of a Bohr atom, we were able to find the energy of a Bohr atom, we were able to find the velocity of an electron in the Bohr atom, and from that, surmising that the electron has to travel around the nucleus in such a way that one wavelength of the electron equals one complete revolution or one complete orbit around the nucleus. And when we use that assumption, we got this as a result. And then when we go and check that result with the Bohr, with the, um, the Broglie wavelength, we find out that that also holds true. So we're able to verify that that is the correct equation. We're able to verify that an electron travels around the nucleus in such a way that one wavelength equals one complete orbit. That is absolutely amazing. And since I'm out of board space, I guess on the next video, we're going to take a look and see what the velocity would be at various orbits around the nucleus, of course, at the second and third and fourth energy levels and so forth, and what the wavelength then would be at these various orbits. So that will be for the next video.